Hi, welcome to The Art of Transformation. I'm your host, Mark Schaff. Today, I get to talk to somebody who also started their career as an artist, but really found that what they are is a creator. They don't tie themselves to one particular kind of creating and now has moved from fabric and clothing design to being an expert gyrotonics instructor. What's interesting about this conversation is that she found herself limited by some of the rules that were out there in that particular community. What's really interesting is to hear how she found her way to creating her own practice, her own business, and actually had that grow even more once she left something behind. Have a listen and I'll see you on the other side. Hey, welcome to the Art of Transformation. I'm here with Domini, my old friend. <laughs> how are you doing, Domini? I'm well, Mark, how are you? I'm good. Um, we're here because you uh, kind of clocked some stuff of mine on social media a while ago and we're like, I think we might have something in common. And, you know, we met, God, what was it? The early 2000s, I think we met and wasn't it? Yeah, it was like early odds. I mean, we're, I think we're kind of coming up on about 20 years of having. <laughs> <laughs> Do you ever look back at your adult life and think, my God, my adult life is old enough to go to college? I, uh, I go to jujitsu, as everybody here knows, because I talk about it all the time. And there are people I roll that I train with who are younger than some of my friendships. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so we met and um, we, we probably met when I was, you know, in art school and, and after art school, um, you know, working in tech, working in, in video games and electronic arts, stuff like that. And then I left. And I went on this whole journey of illustration and fine art. And now, you know, the past few years really focused on my coaching. And you reached out and you were like, I think, I think we might have had kind of similar journeys. Um, and you, when we met, were, uh, I think I only knew you as a clothing designer. So I'd love for you just to give us a little background, kind of tell us, give us the, the high level, like from, you know, from <laughs> there, now, because it's such an interesting shift. Yeah. Um, I would love to, and I guess the the way that I can coalesce in the context of our conversation is my version of the story you just told is like when I when I met you, what I knew of you was that we were both involved in like creating kind of artistic experiences that went along with large dance parties and communal living and warehouse living in San Francisco. Like we had similar right. interests. And what I noted the most about you was your desire to create these multi-level artistic experiences for people. So I didn't know too much about your work and you knew me as a clothing designer because at that point my my teaching, I, so I also teach movement. We'll just present that right now. Yeah. That was kind of taking the backstage as far as what I was presenting to the world. And I was yeah. doing a lot of upcycling. I had a lot, of, I wanted to say politically with my clothing. And I was creating community about that. So that's where our paths intersected. You know? yeah. And then at the, the, you know, San Francisco evolved. And you and I both moved away probably at similar times and began to move into our married lives, our kid lives. And that was also a career shift. Mm -hmm. And what I saw of you then was that your transition into fine art as you went into the East Coast. You and I did a trade. You had me do some clothing for Chloe when she was like pre um, that's right, that's right. You know, pregnant. Yeah, I think with Artemis was that one. I mean, our our kids are also basically the same ages. <laughs> we <laughs> got them from the same back. So um, I have this beautiful portrait you did of my family in exchange that's still hanging on our wall. And then, you know, COVID happens and there's this chapter that took 25 years, you know, in just a few months. Yeah. And that was where I began to notice like a real shift in your presence on social media. And that is like, okay, Mark is now becoming a life coach. And for me, it's like dot, 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 what happened? Because you were so vibrant and so talented as I had known you as an artist that I was confused as to like why that shift would happen. So I followed you for a while and then began to notice these glimmers and finally reached out and said, hey, can we have a coffee? Like, I would love to check in and f like fill in the blanks as far as how I knew you to where you are now. Yeah, it's and funny. it's funny. It's kind of funny. I like the way you put that. Like um, when when I met you, the thing that you were putting out into the world, there was something else that was kind of taking a back seat, and and that was very true for me, you know, as well. I I had done 
kind of a lot of different personal growth things at the time. Like you mentioned, I, lived, I was living in community, learning a lot about, you know, working with teams, essentially. Um, and if, you know, if anybody here is listening and, and ever has ever been to Burning Man, you know, you're working with big teams, asking them to do a ton of work and not paying them. Um, so if you want good leadership, find the good leaders who, who know how to do that. <laughs> you know, but, um, but what's funny is that, um, you know, the coaching work, that was something that I also sort of discovered in San Francisco. That was the first time that I was really introduced to the idea of someone sort of being a coach or, or doing that work. And I got to see that work firsthand with those different workshops, with the men's circle that I was in for and, and still am a part of, but was active in for about four years before I left. And yeah, and then moved to the East Coast and, you know, had this whole other life. And then COVID hit and this old love kind of bubbled up again. Yeah. And the parallel with my life there, especially with that COVID piece, I had always had dueling passions. I mm -hmm. loved to move and teach movement. I love teaching in and of itself, Yeah, except for teaching sewing. I don't like teaching sewing. <laughs> <laughs> I'm far too quick with it. It's like, I don't want to teach sketching or stream of consciousness, you know? And then there was the, the sewing part, which gives me deep joy. And being raised at the time when we were raised, where excelling was such a focus in the context of defining success, how many times were you told growing up that myth of, well, you have to pick one thing and focus on it. You can't just be good at everything. You have to narrow it down. Well, that's all we ever saw, right? I mean, my dad is was, is a pediatrician. You know, he, he went to school, he went to med school, he did one thing, he stopped doing it full time. Now he's retired. Like, but there was no other, there was no dueling passion. I think I, I actually really like that phrase because I think a lot of people, entrepreneurs, creatives can really resonate with that idea of, I have all these different things I want to do. You know, maybe I don't know where to start or, I, do, or ah, I don't know how to do all of them well, that kind of thing. Is that something that you also struggle with or struggled with? I did because I was fed that narrative. And yet yeah. for me, as someone who was like incorrigibly dancing to the beat of my own drummer for the longest time, um, and thanks to some lucky circumstances, just as far as like, you know, I was born, <laughs> how I was born and had opportunities <laughs> to pursue my artistic career, I was never really told that I had to fit someone else's norms. But the coaching as far as like, if you want to be X, Y, and Z, you have to narrow down and focus on all of that. And the image that comes to my head is Michael J. Fox on that water, like the secret of my success, you know, the secret of my success in the elevator. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, um, yeah, I was conflicted because I thought that I needed, I thought I was supposed to want success in that context and that I was somehow doing something wrong by either dancing ballet, teaching yoga, eventually teaching the gyrotonic method. And then if I focused full time on that, I would be sewing all night or focusing on sewing and putting my movement practice to a couple of hours in the afternoons that was just for me. And neither one of those felt right. So finally, I read this meme online, Soul's Rules for Life. And the first one is you will get one body. It is the only body you have. There are no returns and no exchanges. You're going to live your life through it. And I was like, oh my God, this is it. I help people love living life in their bodies. I just do it in a few ways. Mm -hmm. And so for me, finding that unifying mission statement that allowed me to fill in what my soul's purpose was and to let me do it in the ways that I do was just liberating. It was healing and liberating. And finally, I had a unifying statement. Yeah. So you that. You know, go ahead. So that allowed me to let go of, I believe, this false narrative. Like, there's two falsehoods there. One, that extreme success in one niche is what one should want. And two, that you can't have success if you're only doing one thing or if you're if you're doing more than one thing. So, you know, I was like I had feet in both worlds for a while because I had this unifying mission statement. And yeah. then yeah. Now you go on. Cause I think there's something else you want to go into there. Well, it kind of makes me think about um, the COVID shift, right? I, I mean, I think COVID was 
uh, very difficult for a lot of us in a lot of different ways. And, and for me, and, and I'd love to hear your experience, you know, it was definitely uh, the, that, that first year, the, the second year in 2021 was, was a very, very dark time for me for various reasons, very depressed, um, but it was also an opportunity um, even in that, you know, feeling very sad phase, um, I was able to see like, okay, well, what I what I do have right now, and I was fortunate to have that is some time, and I can and I can think about what really matters to me, and I can start to create that unifying statement in a way. You know, I'd done a lot of different things. I, I was the executive director of a nonprofit. I had you know I had an art career. I had just shown in you know at uh, Scope Fair and you know in in Florida in in, uh, in Miami. Uh, all these great things, right? But how do they all fit together? And that was what I really got to sort of think about because what 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 I was doing without the sort of back burner thing that I was doing is that I was I was coaching people, I was teaching, I was working with other artists, I had created these projects, and it was all in an effort to sort of pull people up because I really that that is what really lights me up. You know, it's great to you know sell a piece of art. It's great to you know. Uh, uh, Sell, you know, sell, you know, get get the gig and do the thing. But what what I discovered really lit me up was when I can share that with someone else, and it gives them, you know, it gets them to that that kind of next level. And it wasn't just and it wasn't just teaching. I mean, I was teaching for a long time, but what what it was was that sort of coaching piece. Because what I found was in the teaching. You know, you can teach someone how to sew, which you acknowledge you do not want to do. But like, you can teach someone, <laughs> you can teach someone to move. You can teach someone to do these, to do these different things. But what I find is so interesting is when you, you know, in the process of that over weeks or months, you discover what's getting in their way of actually sinking into that practice. And that's where I really found a lot of joy. And so that is is, is sort of how I ended up doing this. But I'm curious about what your experience was in COVID because I know it was also you know, a shift for you. Yeah. So COVID, it, I had a very unique experience during COVID because the day we went into quarantine was the day my world opened up. Mm. Um, back history, I, in the chapter following when we knew each other and we were young in San Francisco, <laughs> um, and I came down here I focused heavily on growing my career as a gyrotonic master trainer. So becoming an educator in a system, you can see the machine, the complicated, lovely thing behind me. This yeah, is I a see wonderful your system. Social media, your videos, yeah. you have so much great stuff out there. So I will post links in the, in the, um, in the show. Yeah. Thank you. And up until that moment, the quarantine hit, the gyrotonic system did not allow it to be taught online. And to even post a social media video, technically you were supposed to send all of your videos to headquarters first to have them approved. And you couldn't have more than 30 seconds of any one exercise. And that was so hard for me because I had a resonance inside. Like, you know, when the world gives you information and it's mm -hmm. like the, the universe tells you something, you're like, all right, well, this is what we're gonna do. Well, the universe had told me, you are supposed to teach online. You're supposed to teach breath work online. And that is what you're going to do to help heal the world. And that was one of those moments, you know, I was on a walk and sometimes the universe just drops a telegram in, and there was that. And that happened in 2015. And so I was so conflicted because I, although I teach many different disciplines, I Wait, consider the your online practice in 2015. Um, I was present online before that. And I, yes, basically by 2016, I had found a way to start teaching online, but my conflict was the system that I consider to be the foundation for my approach to movement was not allowing me to put yeah. any of their content, anything related to them online. And I'm not someone to go behind anyone's back. I'm a terrible liar. I ask forgiveness, usually not permission. Um, that's a different conversation. <laughs> but so I, t I got pregnant with my second child and I was using breath work in the gyrotonic system to find fluidity in my body. And the videos I was posting about that were resonant and people were really getting excited about it. And I was like, you know what, I'm just going to post my stuff. And when they tell me to take it down, I'll take it down, which started getting me in a lot of trouble with a system that really likes to control its things and has a different view of what the internet and what exposure means for the protection of their system. I was then in conflict with that. 
And that was an ongoing narrative. Mm. All I had wanted was to share my work online, to to get it available to people globally, both for free and paid and different programs. But I had this vision, like my, my soul had this vision and I wasn't allowed to. And the day we went into quarantine was the day that the gyrotonic system had to finally say, okay, fine, you mm. can teach this online. And so at this moment where the rest of my community had been trained by essentially like their family structure, their business family structure to view online as something that was t scary, that was foreign, and also that I was an enemy, all of a sudden I had all these skills that I could share with my teacher community and bring this stuff that I had so desperately wanted to bring into view. And so I burst forward the same day that we, that we had to stay home. Mm, and mm. my life, those first few months, I opened up a studio, basically a virtual studio. All my classes were free or by donation for about three months. And I was teaching 10 classes a week and everything I'd ever wanted to share. And I was like, this is my investment in whatever future I'm supposed to have because this happens now. Yeah. So that was the shift. One yeah. one more thing, and then I want to hear all the thoughts that I see in your yeah, head. Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm <laughs> I think that both you and I share a desire to have impact. That for us, success in our lives has to do with how many people we have managed to positively impact in the world. When I was doing fashion shows and ma mass producing from my own hands, many, many, many things, you've seen how quickly I sew, I, I felt like I, person, that... Yeah. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> There were some fun nights. Um, some fun nights. We can't talk about all of those nights, but yes, there was fun, some fun <laughs> nights. <laughs> yes, some, some kind of quote about the grand building there. Um, but back to this, I felt like I could have more impact from my sewing because I was presenting shows and the clothing was in many stores and like art having words, like at, art having a meaning that is conveyed beyond words, all that. But mm -hmm. all of a sudden there was this shift where I was teaching classes to 65 to 100 people all around the world. And I was hearing from them how what I taught them, they were using with their students and how it was creating a positive impact for them. I fundamentally believe that when we are good in our bodies, when our nervous systems aren't giving us signals of pain, that we're more able to be present and patient and yeah, yeah have a peaceful and a creative relationship with the world as opposed to an antagonistic relationship with the world. And so yeah. at that point, there was kind of like a never looking back. My impact positively mm -hmm. on this world will be stronger if I focus on this as my career. Hmm. You know, something that I get asked a lot that I'm curious about with you too is, you know, with, with a shift like that, you know, you had spent, you know, a, a, de a decade or more, um, working towards your purpose, working towards your mission, creating your impact through one particular art form. And, and, you know, you had your movement in the background. And then there was this shift where you're, you know, where you maybe took over a couple of years, but you were kind of all in on this. So people, you know, ask me about, about my art now that I'm, you know, doing this work. And, you know, do you, do you feel like, is the question I get asked and I'll ask you, like, do you feel like, you know, there's a loss there of some sort of creative energy, or do you feel like, you know, pe people ask, like, do you feel like you gave up? Hmm. I have my um, own answer. I'm curious, yours first. Yeah, <laughs> I think people are far too afraid of me to ask me if I ever gave, if I feel like I gave up. Well, I just asked, they might so think it. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, absolutely not. And that um, that kind of comes another container of. I cannot be contained and I don't do well with being told what to do. And so like, thank goodness I found a way to become self-employed. Um, or maybe I would have learned skills for compromise that lack, but I take a lot of cues from the, the information. Have you, did you read my recent newsletter about being stuck on a boat for a week? I don't that, think I've that one. I was just on vacation okay. for like two weeks. So I'm, I'm behind on newsletter. All right, no problem. Um, again, I'm going to try to stay on topic. It's hard with you because you just light up all these creative <laughs> pathways. Just naturally, your energy does. That's a testimonial so, right there. I'm going to clip that, yeah. <laughs> extract it. You can put my name to it. Where was I? Um, do I feel like I failed? No, no because like, if... You like you've quit, not fa I mean, I think that we are both grown up enough and creative enough to know that all of these lives, you know, all these twists and turns are not failures, but they're opportunities to learn, to 
hone in more deeply on our purpose to make moves that are more and more and more in alignment. But um, there's the question of really feeling like maybe you left something behind in the same way, almost that you were, you know, as you were doing your sewing work, you know, you had this other movement thing that was like, as you said, kind of back burner. Like, how, where, how, did, how do you feel about that, that creative modality, you know, now that you're kind of, all, you know, all in or, or mostly all in on, on this other work? Yeah. Sewing, I wa- you become what you do. If mm. I wanted to sew, I, my sewing studio still exists. It's the same studio where I go and I do all of my video editing and all of my writing, all of the back end work that allows me to create a, a online container for learning. So if I go into my studio and physically I find myself wanting to sew or going to the fabric, I will, you know, unless there's like a class deadline or something. And I don't. I do that once a year. When the seasons change, the sun goes away, I spend about a month in my studio crying, drinking wine, and listening to podcasts and sewing. And so there's one collection that happens a year, and it basically pays for Christmas. What, <laughs> one year I called it the Blood, Sweaters, and Tears collection. You know, there's always oh, something. Okay. And it's nice to know that I have a following for the clothes. And sure, every so often I'll get emails from people asking if I make the pants, and my answer is um, maybe later. You know, like yeah. join my mailing list. you will be the first to know. But I, I think if I didn't feel satisfied in what I do, then I would be sewing. And it came as a surprise to me that editing my videos, that creating the background images, coming up with class concepts and writing fulfilled me creatively as much as sewing did. Yeah, I, you know, it's funny. I, um, I feel the same way. Um, people ask me about that. And you know, my, my, the shortest answer I know is that I, I feel like I'm doing the most creative work of my life right now. I, I, I do have the, all these dueling, you know, like, like you, like I love getting into sort of new tech and we spent probably 10 minutes before this call talking about different video editors and, you know, <laughs> transcript editors and like geeking out on that. And, you know, also art and also making clothes. My daughter, who is just like an art, just a, I don't know. She's, she spent yesterday and I feel like this too, like she, she just had this idea. <laughs> I don't know what she was doing over in the corner. And then I was like, okay, it's bedtime. She's like, daddy, come look. And she had taken a bucket and, and pasted a whole bunch of stuff on it and turned it into like a little cat's house. She also made a cat out of a crumpled up ball of paper. And there was a water slide into a ball pit. <laughs> and I was just like, this is awesome. I, you know, there was no like, well, what's the point of that? Well, whatever, because it was the process that brought her joy. And from there, I think, you can, you know, in, in many cases, almost sort of figure it out. But what <laughs> more salient, you know, I was talking to um, somebody who's in my, you know, in my creative uh, Unleashed Creativity membership. And, you know, when I when I met her, I actually just reached out to her cold on Facebook because her thing popped up in my feed. I, I, I think we may have been friends through some art community. I don't, I don't really know her. But she was having this question of like, am I really an artist if I'm not making art? You know, she was a new mom and sort of, you know, having all those struggles, which you and I both know. Um, I reached out and I said, you want to talk? You know, we ended up having a chat and she ended up joining our program. Six months later, she's launched her own brand. She's making more art than ever. She's she she was frustrated and tired and sad at work. Now she's actually really, really happy and sees how all of those skills she can use together in this new way. Like. You know, I have a computer science degree, which I, I think I've mentioned and, and, and people don't know because they see me, you know, as an artist. But like that was, you know, that was before. And then there was like art and then there's all these other things. And now actually with coaching, I kind of get to do all of it. I get to work with different creatives. I get to do the the coaching conversations. I get to play with different tech as we're doing today. Like I really do. I feel like I'm doing the most creative work of my life. And, you know, I think back to something you said at the very beginning, it pushes against that idea that there's a right way to do anything. Yeah. An analogy that came up to me just in your, the last paragraph of what you were sharing, it's like, we are still making art. Art is a creative conversation, but when you're teaching the raw materials are your students and it's immutable and changing form, you know, and there's so much of this that's going on and it can, in, the, in its best form, it is very honest. You know, sure, we we like we need a teaching structure to have a framework, but it doesn't mean that you're rigidly just parroting words. Ideally, it's doing this from where you are and where your student is, and we are actually creating really powerful art, creating creativity and transformation with that. 
but it's not like it's only coming from the bucket and the water slide and the mm -hmm. cat. I'm talking about the cat things here. It's like, it's really coming from changing elements. Like, oh, like that, what is this? Well, that could be a water slide, you know? And there's a conversation on both sides that feels very equal in its contribution. Yeah, you mentioned that earlier about sort of learning from your students. Um, say more, say more about about that that creative conversation that you're creating with with your students. Yeah, gosh, like it took some time to settle into what it is to teach on Zoom, primarily because before then it was just watching pre-recorded videos where someone comes, they make the statement, they do the class, and so I didn't really see a space for allowing that to unfold naturally. But now that I've found this rhythm and checking in with my students, like for one, letting go of this idea that I had to market each class with a specific goal. Mm. Gyrotonic for back pain. Now for neurological stability, you know, and just keeping one focus. And those are great for a teacher training program. But now when I offer my workshops, I'll give a general idea, like we are going to work on liberating the upper body and its connection with the abdominals. We're going to be working with this particular methodology. And then starting off with, hey, students, like, what are your thoughts? What are you struggling with? And maybe even having an email out to the people who register saying, hit me up early, send me emails. Like, I'm going to use this to build class. Yes. Yeah. And then even afterwards, you know, offering extended, um, extended access with full access to me and using their questions to help me make video responses that I then put on social media, you know, learning from students' questions and observations, or even that part, like for me, and I'm sure you're going to have a similar story, uh, a similar response when I describe this, someone will start to tell me about their bodies, about what they're dealing with today. And usually that's how I start every session, be it a group class or a private client coming to my studio. Tell me about your body. And they say, well, what do you want to know? And I say, start in the middle and stab wildly outwards. And then they just start telling me about what they're feeling or what they're thinking. And my mind starts getting pictures of what their body might want to do. For me, it's not a word mm -hmm. response. It's a mm -hmm. visual response or like a kinesthetic response in my own body. And then I'll say, hang on a second, let me try what your energy body is doing. And I'll try whatever exercise is in my mind. Yeah. And then we begin to understand why that person needs to go there. Yeah. I think <laughs> it's funny when you're, <laughs> when you were saying that I went in kind of a different direction, which is just that that's, it's, it's such a, it's such a win-win way to create, create a course. Uh, you know, when, when I have people join, you know, our course and our membership, I do. I, I, I meet with a lot of them as, as much as I can. I definitely, you know, communicate with them over email or, you know, some sort of messaging. Um, and I find out, you know, what is it, what is it that you're up against? What is it that you, that you want? And, you know, in the case of our creative group and, and kind of like, who do you want to be in the, you know, who do you want to be in the world? Who do you want to be as an artist? Who do you want to be as a creator, uh, a writer, a dancer? And, you know, you know, they, I, I, I don't know how to put this, but like they end up, you know, giving me the content that I need to present back in a lot of ways or giving me, you know, sometimes they, you know, they have questions and I, you know, I don't have answers, but I'm so excited to go find it. And, you know, you and I both know, I think that when you're in, you know, when you're in the sort of teaching, coaching, you know, world, you're, you're immersed. I'm sure you, you know, you, you write about it on your newsletter, you, you put out your videos, but you're also reading about stuff. You're looking at other videos, you're looking at other teachers, you're constantly filling that library. So when someone comes to you, what I, what I get from you is that when someone comes to you, you have kind of a wealth of, of tools that you can use to create a container that is specific to them which is something that I, I really like to do. And especially in this kind of, you know, I, you've mentioned, um, I don't know if specifically, but like things like your course or your membership or things like that, you know, these are ongoing opportunities to tailor, you know, the teachings that you have or the guidance that you give to that specific person, which is, God, it's just light years away from where things were however many years ago when you could like download a video or whatever. Yeah, a hundred percent. And to to get the additional feedback from your students that also is feedback about how the world is evolving. And to use that as an opportunity yes. to continually be re-presenting the same mm -hmm. truth, but that's more current for wherever we're feeling at that time. 
also like allowing ourselves to be mutable and change just because we're presenting something six months, like that the six months ago was one way, doesn't mean that's wrong. It means it was right for where we were in the world at that time. And it's still probably equally valid, but also things can be a different way. And there's this beauty in when someone asks you something directly and in that moment, you're like, I don't know. Or I've struggled with this too. Mm -hmm. And when you respond honestly and teach class, like how many times 45 minutes later have you been like, oh my God, this is the answer to the question. Thank you so much. Because 45 minutes, we don't five answer. Minutes, yeah. I had this, tw- I had this experience yesterday. I, I, I was with, I was doing the monthly call with our group and um, I was like, okay, so here's, you know, here's a series of questions. I'm going to have, you know, you all answer them. We're going to do some breakout rooms. And this one guy who is very successful, uh, you know, uh, with his art, he's got a great job, all this other, like, kind of, you know, he, he's he's doing fine. But he's also, like, the most chill person I've ever met, um, Real, like, truly. Like, no, nothing, I, I've, I've never seen anything really get under his skin, you know. And he's had all the same kind of things happen to him that's happened to all of us, you know, all kind, you know, health stuff for him, his friend, like, you know, we've all dealt with these things. But, you know, he just has this attitude of like, okay, well, that's what's happening. And uh, what are we going to do now? And he's like very chill. So I gave this exercise and he was like, kind of like, I, I don't, I don't really have, I don't feel like I have the, the language of the question. Like I, I, it doesn't really make sense to me because I don't, I don't have that same block or that same problem or that same mindset. And we actually got to improve the, the que- I've, I've now gone back to my, you know, my materials and, and changed it to improve the question to be, you know, more specific and more general in some ways, thanks to his, you know, his feedback, which, you know, kind of gets me to the, to the point of, I, I think, you know, I don't, I don't know. <laughs> There's a great uh, comedian, Josh Gondelman, who said, he's like, you know, I, you know, these teachers who say that they learn as much from their students. Um, he's like, I, I think you're bad teachers. Like, you should know a lot more than your students. It was a joke, obviously. But um, it, it gets me to the point of like, uh, you know, as a teacher or or an entrepreneur or a leader in your space, the importance of of truly listening and being willing and open to make those changes. How how have you done that with even in the last say four years with what you've been doing since 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 you know Gyrotronics has opened up online for you like how how have you um, listened and made changes that have served your communities? Oh gosh, I mean I think a lot of it has been to let go of the defensiveness, like of the need to defend mm. my position. Hmm. And let it become, again, the word that comes up for me a lot is mutable. There may be a better word out there for what I'm discovering, but like that kind of malleable softness um, to be, to to hear feedback if people said that class was kind of fast or I didn't get that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And as opposed to trying to defend my position, to let those responses in my mind come up and to see that like one of the benefits i think of being a teacher is the personal growth because you see your reflection in your students as much as they seek as much as they seek and see their reflection in you and your classes we we find more aspects of ourselves when we react to feedback um so there was that piece um to to let there be a give and a take when students would ask me a question and by the way now i i mean i stepped down as a gyrotonic master trainer in order to be able to advocate for the system from the positions that I hold. Hmm. They have their own way of wanting to state the the language around movement and also their perspectives on how it works in their own roles. And I'm outside of those boxes now. I thoroughly advocate for the system, but it's in a way that actually um, doesn't rub them very right. And so I had to move away from an official position as an educator for that system and just Mm -hmm. maintain my license to teach to teach freely from my own perspective. And I think that was, it was scary letting that go. It was scary letting the title go because I had worked so hard for that title. And Mm. in this tiny niche of exercise that most people don't even know what the hell this machine is, that title matters a lot. Yeah. And so I dropped it off for a while. And then now I'm like former gyrotonic master trainer. So this (laughs) headquarters themselves is no longer feeling like I might be misrepresenting myself from my own educational authority that they bestowed upon me. 
And I said, I'm just out there from my own perspective, multi, like you see this machine, well, the rest of my room has like yoga trapeze apparatus and then like vibration equipment and then like other shit yeah. I like to build. And all of those get thrown in the mix. And I have a t my own teacher training program now called Proprio-Synthesis, and it's designed for multidisciplinary instructors who want to be able to teach from their, their own body of knowledge and devise solutions for their clients that are unique to their clients, not coming from some other protocol, but coming from principles of movement that we find as we move through all the things that speak to us. So that softening has allowed me, I think, to, to learn most. And the thing that teaches me the most is when a student's like, I don't get this. I don't understand. Can you say it a different way? And at first you're like, oh, you're wrong. I'm defensive, or at least I am, at least in my head for 30 seconds. But even as I begin to speak it back, it's like, oh, I see where I could refine this. And like, how, how can we become more inclusive in our teaching? Hmm. Yeah. So I, one of uh, one of my friends, colleagues, uh, this guy, Erickson Proper, he turned me on to a quote from some. Then I'm going to screw it up. But um, you know, he yeah, he told me, and it was really stuck with me, is that you know everything is your teacher if you're paying attention. Um, yeah. And it, and it goes, you know, it goes with with me and and the members of my group or my students. It goes with me and my kids. Um, you know, and you and and it's a balance, right, between holding that space of you know your own expertise and what it is that you want to do and what people need. Like, I mean, the kids' examples, you know, great. They constantly think that they need things uh, or or want things. Um, my daughter very much wanted a bunch of candy this morning before going off to camp, and I, you know, I I, I didn't I didn't I wasn't open to that. <laughs> um, but with what what I love about being you know, an entrepreneur and working in this way is, is the framework of listening. There's something in the, uh, at least in my coach training that we learned that I think is like kind of the most valuable framework for, for that kind of, of listening and getting feedback from people is, is to ask them for that feedback. And the framework that, that I learned was essentially not the compliment sandwich. I know everyone talks about the compliment sandwich, you know, you say a nice thing and then you give the real juice and then you say some other nice thing. Yeah, but, but can't about, you see that coming miles away now? Yeah, you see it. My, yeah, <laughs> someone's like, oh, I really, you're like, okay, just come on. Um, no, but it's like when I ask for feedback and what I found to be, the reason I like this framework is that it, it, it does put both people kind of on the same side as opposed to me sort of saying, okay, here's the work and, you know, what do you think about it? Um, it's asking, well, okay, so, you know, you took this class, you did this exercise. What, what worked well for you? What insights mm -hmm. did you get? What, what stood out to you that you're going to take with you as a positive outcome or a positive insight? And then what would make it even better? And, that, and, and, and I really like the wording of that question because it kind of puts you both, if, you, if, you, if you've done facilitation training, it sort of puts you in the, puts you in the chairs facing the same way. Like you're both mm -hmm. kind of working on it. You're both aligned. It's asking them to like sit almost in a seat right next to you and say, we're both working on this. What would yeah. make it even better? It invites people into the process of creating, you know, your course or whatever, but that is going to benefit them and hopefully many, many other people. And the um, psychology, be the psychology behind that too is so nice because your students want to please you. And part of our <laughs> growth is like, they want to be on the same page, on the same team. Part of our growth as teachers is finding out what didn't work. You know, where, where did we, where could we have done better? It's very hard for people to give negative feedback to someone to their face, um, and especially in this like student teacher context that we're talking about. What would make it even better allows that to be collaborative, and yes. we can also then learn where we failed. So, I'm going to ask you. Um, I'm looking at the at the clock, and this is a this is a good one. It's a long one, but um, I want to ask you. I'll make a statement. I'm going to. I, I do it differently every time, but I'm going to make a statement and I'd love you, I'd love for you to, uh, you know, this is like, mo you know, like model UN or debate or something. Uh, you know, you, are you for or against the statement or why? All transformation is collaborative. True or false, go. I say true. <laughs> I see no other way than that, especially if you, 
agree with this statement. The only truly monogamous relationship we have is the relationship between our soul and our body, because that's the only thing that's going to be with you from birth until death. Hmm. Our experience of the world is by nature collaborative, right? It's coming into our conscious mind through our nervous system, through our body's relationship with space and all of the influences. I could not see transformation as something that could happen without relationship. Yeah. Um, well, if people are looking to collaborate with you as a, as a student or in any other way, where is the best place for people to find you? And again, we'll put all this in the show notes. So the easiest place to find me is my website. It's dominianne.com. You can find contact pages and, you know, on demand videos and depending on how far you want to dig in this massive labyrinth website that I've built over the last eight years, you can find out a lot there. Also on Instagram, um, I'm Domini underscore and my creative design page is at this point simply not active for obvious reasons. But yeah, Domini underscore Anne is kind of like where I'm putting myself out on social media. Yeah. And I'll put a plug in for your newsletter. I, I actively unsubscribe from everything because it's just a mess in my updates folder but i love getting your newsletter and i recommend everybody give it a shot because it's great stories and even if you <laughs> even if you're not at all interested in gyrotonics or <laughs> anything we've talked about they're just fun stories and that's what i love about uh, i have a few newsletters that i subscribe to and that's pretty much the thread through all of them so everybody should go out and uh, find the website sign up for the newsletter we'll put a link for that in the show notes too um we'll close this for now but i suspect that we will have more to talk about dominique thank you so much for your time and for this great connected conversation you're welcome mark thanks too it's a great way to start our day thanks for listening i hope you enjoyed the episode one of the things that i love about this episode is how my friend dominique had to leave something behind to create something new for herself so look, if you got a lot from this episode or you can think of someone who needs to hear it, please share it. Leave a comment, like it, subscribe to the channel wherever you're listening. Everything that you do to support us helps me create more of these episodes with these great guests. So thanks for listening and I'll see you on the next one.